Chapter Three, Part Two of A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce, read by Ty Hines. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I am cast away from the sight of thine eyes. Words taken, my dear little brothers in Christ, from the Book of Psalms, thirtieth chapter, twenty-third verse. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. The preacher began to speak in a quiet, friendly tone. His face was kind, and he joined gently the fingers of each hand, forming a frail cage by the union of their tips. This morning we endeavoured, in our reflection upon hell, to make what our holy founder calls in his book of spiritual exercises the composition of place. We endeavoured, that is, to imagine with the senses of the mind in our imagination the material character of that awful place and of the physical torments which all who are in hell endure. This evening we shall consider for a few moments the nature of the spiritual torments of hell. Sin, remember, is a twofold enormity. It is a base consent to the promptings of our corrupt nature to the lower instincts, to that which is gross and beast-like. It is also a turning away from the counsel of our higher nature, from all that is pure and holy, from the holy God himself. For this reason mortal sin is punished in hell by two different forms of punishment physical and spiritual. Now of all these spiritual pains, by far the greatest is the pain of loss, so great in fact that in itself it is a torment greater than all the others. St. Thomas, the greatest doctor of the church, the angelic doctor as he is called, says that the worst damnation consists in this, that the understanding of man is totally deprived of divine light, and his affection obstinately turned away from the goodness of God. God, remember, is a being infinitely good, and therefore the loss of such a being must be a loss infinitely painful. In this life we have not a very clear idea of what such a loss must be, but the damned in hell, for their greater torment, have a full understanding of that which they have lost, and understand that they have lost it through their own sins, and have lost it for ever. At the very instant of death the bonds of the flesh are broken asunder and the soul at once flies towards God, as towards the centre of her existence. Remember, my dear little boys, our souls long to be with God. We come from God, we live by God, we belong to God. We are His, inalienably His. God loves with a divine love every human soul, and every human soul lives in that love. How could it be otherwise? Every breath that we draw Every thought of our brain, every instant of life proceeds from God's inexhaustible goodness. And if it be pain for a mother to be parted from her child, for a man to be exiled from hearth and home, for friend to be sundered from friend, oh, think what pain, what anguish it must be for the poor soul to be spurned from the presence of the supremely good and loving Creator, who has called that soul into existence from nothingness and sustained it in life and loved it with an immeasurable love. This, then, to be separated forever from its greatest good, from God, and to feel the anguish of that separation, knowing full well that it is unchangeable, this is the greatest torment which the created soul is capable of bearing. Poena damni, the pain of loss. The second pain which will afflict the souls of the damned in hell is the pain of conscience. Just as in dead bodies worms are engendered by putrefaction, so in the souls of the lost there arises a perpetual remorse from the putrefaction of sin, the sting of conscience, the worm, as Pope Innocent III calls it, of the triple sting. The first sting inflicted by this cruel worm will be the memory of past pleasures. Oh, what a dreadful memory will that be! In the lake of all devouring flame, the proud king will remember the pomps of his court, the wise but wicked man, his libraries and instruments of research, the lover of artistic pleasures, his marbles and pictures and other art treasures, he who delighted in the pleasures of the table, his gorgeous feasts, his dishes prepared with such delicacy, his choice wines. The miser will remember his hoard of gold, the robber his ill-gotten wealth, the angry and revengeful and merciless murderers, their deeds of blood and violence in which they reveled, the impure and adulterous, the unspeakable and filthy pleasures in which they delighted. 
they will remember all this and loathe themselves and their sins. For how miserable will all those pleasures seem to the soul condemned to suffer in hell-fire for ages and ages! How they will rage and fume to think that they have lost the bliss of heaven for the dross of earth, for a few pieces of metal, for vain honours, for bodily comforts, for a tingling of the nerves. They will repent indeed, and this is the second sting of the worm of conscience, a late and fruitless sorrow for sins committed. Divine justice insists that the understanding of those miserable wretches be fixed continually on the sins of which they were guilty. And moreover, as St. Augustine points out, God will impart to them his own knowledge of sin, so that sin will appear to them in all its hideous malice as it appears to the eyes of God himself. They will behold their sins in all their foulness and repent, but it will be too late, and then they will bewail the good occasions which they neglected. This is the last and deepest and most cruel sting of the worm of conscience. The conscience will say, You had time and opportunity to repent and would not. You were brought up religiously by your parents. You had the sacraments and grace and indulgences of the church to aid you. You had the minister of God to preach to you to call you back when you had strayed, to forgive you your sins, no matter how many, how abominable, if only you had confessed and repented. No, you would not. You flouted the ministers of holy religion, you turned your back on the confessional, you wallowed deeper and deeper in the mire of sin. God appealed to you, threatened you, entreated you to return to him. Oh, what shame! What misery! The ruler of the universe entreated you, a creature of clay, to love him who made you and to keep his law. No, you would not. And now, though you were to flood all hell with your tears if you could still weep, all that sea of repentance would not gain for you what a single tear of true repentance shed during your mortal life would have gained for you. You implore now a moment of earthly life wherein to repent. In vain. That time is gone gone for ever. Such is the threefold sting of conscience, the viper which gnaws the very heart's core of the wretches in hell, so that filled with hellish fury they curse themselves for their folly, and curse the evil companions who have brought them to such ruin, and curse the devils who tempted them in life and now mock them in eternity, and even revile and curse the supreme being whose goodness and patience they scorned and slighted, but whose justice and power they cannot evade. The next spiritual pain to which the damned are subjected is the pain of extension. Man, in his earthly life, though he be capable of many evils, is not capable of them all at once, inasmuch as one evil corrects and counteracts another, just as one poison frequently corrects another. In hell, on the contrary, one torment, instead of counteracting another, lends it still greater force. And moreover, as the internal faculties are more perfect than the external senses, so they are more capable of suffering. Just as every sense is afflicted with a fitting torment, so is every spiritual faculty. The fancy with horrible images, the sensitive faculty with alternate longing and rage, the mind and understanding with an interior darkness more terrible even than the exterior darkness which reigns in that dreadful prison. The malice, impotent though it be, which possesses these demon souls, is an evil of boundless extension, of limitless duration, a frightful state of wickedness which we can scarcely realise unless we bear in mind the enormity of sin and the hatred God bears to it. Opposed to this pain of extension, and yet coexistent with it, we have the pain of intensity. Hell is the centre of evils, and, as you know, Things are more intense at their centres than at their remotest points. There are no contraries or admixtures of any kind to temper or soften in the least the pains of hell. Nay, things which are good in themselves become evil in hell. Company, elsewhere a source of comfort to the afflicted, will be there a continual torment. Knowledge, so much longed for as the chief good of the intellect, will there be hated worse than ignorance. Light, so much coveted by all creatures, from the lord of creation down to the humblest plant in the forest, will be loathed intensely. In this life our sorrows are either not very long or not very great, because nature either overcomes them by habits 
or puts an end to them by sinking under their weight. But in hell the torments cannot be overcome by habit, for while they are of terrible intensity they are at the same time of continual variety, each pain, so to speak, taking fire from another and re-endowing that which has enkindled it with a still fiercer flame. Nor can nature escape from these intense and various tortures by succumbing to them, for the soul is sustained and maintained in evil, so that its suffering may be the greater. Boundless extension of torment, incredible intensity of suffering, unceasing variety of torture. This is what the divine majesty, so outraged by sinners, demands. This is what the holiness of heaven, slighted and set aside for the lustful and low pleasures of the corrupt flesh, requires. This is what the blood of the innocent Lamb of God, shed for the redemption of sinners, trampled upon by the vilest of the vile, insists upon. Last and crowning torture of all the tortures of that awful place is the eternity of hell. Eternity. O oh, dread the dire word! Eternity! What mind of man can understand it? And remember, it is an eternity of pain. Even though the pains of hell were not so terrible as they are, yet they would become infinite, as they are destined to last for ever. But while they are everlasting, they are at the same time, as you know, intolerably intense, unbearably extensive. To bear even the sting of an insect for all eternity would be a dreadful torment. What must it be, then, to bear the manifold tortures of hell for ever, for ever, for all eternity, not for a year or for an age, but for ever? Try to imagine the awful meaning of this. You have often seen the sand on the seashore, how fine are its tiny grains, and how many of those tiny little grains go to make up the small handful which a child grasps in its play. Now imagine a mountain of that sand, a million miles high, reaching from the earth to the farthest heavens, and a million miles broad, extending to remotest space, and a million miles in thickness. And imagine such an enormous mass of countless particles of sand, multiplied as often as there are leaves in the forest, drops of water in the mighty ocean, feathers on birds, scales on fish, hairs on animals, atoms in the vast expanse of the air. And imagine that at the end of every million years a little bird came to that mountain and carried away in its beak a tiny grain of that sand. How many millions upon millions of centuries would pass before that bird had carried away even a square foot of that mountain? How many eons upon eons of ages before it had carried away all? Yet at the end of that immense stretch of time not even one instant of eternity could be said to have ended. At the end of all those billions and trillions of years, eternity would have scarcely begun. And if that mountain rose again after it had been all carried away, and if the bird came again and carried it all away again grain by grain, and if it so rose and sank as many times as there are stars in the sky, atoms in the air, drops of water in the sea, leaves on the trees, feathers upon birds, scales upon fish, hairs upon animals, at the end of all those innumerable risings and sinkings of that immeasurably vast mountain, not one single instant of eternity could be said to have ended. Even then, at the end of such a period, after that eon of time, the mere thought of which makes our very brain reel dizzily, eternity would scarcely have begun. A holy saint, one of our own fathers I believe it was, was once vouchsafed a vision of hell. It seemed to him that he stood in the midst of a great hall, dark and silent save for the ticking of a great clock. The ticking went on unceasingly, and it seemed to this saint that the sound of the ticking was the ceaseless repetition of the words ever, never, ever, never, ever to be in hell, never to be in heaven, ever to be shut off from the presence of God, never to enjoy the beatific vision ever to be eaten with flames, gnawed by vermin, goaded with burning spikes, never to be free from those pains, ever to have the conscience upbraid one, the memory in rage, the mind filled with darkness and despair, never to escape, ever to curse and revile the foul demons who gloat fiendishly over the misery of their dupes, never to behold the shining raiment of the blessed spirits.
ever to cry out of the abyss of fire to God for an instant, a single instant of respite from such awful agony, never to receive, even for an instant, God's pardon, ever to suffer, never to enjoy, ever to be damned, never to be saved, ever, never, ever, never. Oh, what a dreadful punishment! An eternity of endless agony, of endless bodily and spiritual torment, without one ray of hope, without one moment of cessation, of agony limitless in intensity, of torment infinitely varied, of torture that sustains eternally that which it eternally devours, of anguish that everlastingly preys upon the spirit while it racks the flesh, an eternity, every instant of which is itself an eternity of woe. Such is the terrible punishment decreed for those who die in mortal sin by an almighty and a just God. Yes, a just God. Men, reasoning always as men, are astonished that God should mete out an everlasting and infinite punishment in the fires of hell for a single grievous sin. They reason thus because, blinded by the gross illusion of the flesh and the darkness of human understanding, they are unable to comprehend the hideous malice of mortal sin. They reason thus because they are unable to comprehend that even venial sin is of such a foul and hideous nature that even if the omnipotent Creator could end all the misery and evil in the world, the wars, the diseases, the robberies, the crimes, the deaths, the murders, on condition that he would allow a single venial sin to pass unpunished, a single venial sin, a lie, an angry look, a moment of willful sloth, he, the great omnipotent God, could not do so, because sin, be it in thought or deed, is a transgression of his law, and God would not be God if he did not punish the transgressor. A sin, an instant of rebellious pride of the intellect, made Lucifer and a third part of the cohort of angels fall from their glory. A sin, an instant of folly and weakness, drove Adam and Eve out of Eden and brought death and suffering into the world. To retrieve the consequences of that sin, the only begotten Son of God came down to earth, lived and suffered and died a most painful death, hanging for three hours on the cross. Oh, my dear little brethren in Christ Jesus, will we then offend that good Redeemer and provoke his anger? Will we trample again upon that torn and mangled corpse? Will we spit upon that face so full of sorrow and love? Will we too, like the cruel Jews and the brutal soldiers, Mock that gentle and compassionate Saviour, who trod alone for our sake the awful winepress of sorrow. Every word of sin is a wound in his tender side. Every sinful act is a thorn piercing his head. Every impure thought, deliberately yielded to, is a keen lance transfixing that sacred and loving heart. No, no, it is impossible for any human being to do that which offends so deeply the Divine Majesty that which is punished by an eternity of agony, that which crucifies again the Son of God and makes a mockery of him. I pray to God that my poor words may have availed today to confirm in holiness those who are in a state of grace, to strengthen the wavering, to lead back to the state of grace the poor soul that has strayed, if any such be among you. I pray to God, and do you pray with me, that we may repent of our sins. I will ask you now, all of you, to repeat after me the act of contrition, kneeling here in this humble chapel in the presence of God. He is there in the tabernacle, burning with love for mankind, ready to comfort the afflicted. Be not afraid. No matter how many or how foul the sins, if you only repent of them, they will be forgiven you. Let no worldly shame hold you back. God is still the merciful Lord, who wishes not the eternal death of the sinner but rather that he be converted and live. He called you to him. You are his. He made you out of nothing. He loved you as only a God can love. His arms are open to receive you, even though you have sinned against him. Come to him, poor sinner, poor vain and erring sinner. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the hour. The priest rose, and turning towards the altar, knelt upon the step before the tabernacle in the fallen gloom. He waited till all the chapel had knelt and every least noise was still. Then, raising his head, he repeated the act of contrition, phrase by phrase, with fervour. 
the boys answered him phrase by phrase. Stephen, his tongue cleaving to his palate, bowed his head, praying with his heart. O oh my God! O oh my God! I am heartily sorry. I am heartily sorry. For having offended thee. For having offended thee. And I detest my sins. And I detest my sins. Above every other evil. Above every other evil. Because they displease thee, my God. Because they displease thee, my God. Who art so deserving. Who art so deserving. Of all my love. Of all my love. And I firmly purpose. And I firmly purpose. By thy holy grace. By thy holy grace. Never more to offend thee. Never more to offend thee. And to amend my life. And to amend my life. He went up to his room after dinner in order to be alone with his soul. And at every step his soul seemed to sigh. At every step his soul mounted with his feet, sighing in the ascent through a region of viscid gloom. He halted on the landing before the door and then, grasping the porcelain knob, opened the door quickly. He waited in fear, his soul pining within him, praying silently that death might not touch his brow as he passed over the threshold, that the fiends that inhabit darkness might not be given power over him. He waited still at the threshold, as at the entrance to some dark cave. Faces were there, eyes. They waited and watched. We knew perfectly well, of course, that though it was bound to come to the light, he would find considerable difficulty in endeavouring to try to induce himself, to try to endeavour to ascertain the spiritual plenipotentiary, and so we knew, of course, perfectly well. Murmuring faces waited and watched. Murmurous voices filled the dark shell of the cave. He feared intensely in spirit and in flesh, but raising his head bravely, he strode into the room firmly. A doorway, a room, the same room, same window. He told himself calmly that those words had absolutely no sense which had seemed to rise murmurously from the dark. He told himself that it was simply his room with the door open. He closed the door and, walking swiftly to the bed, knelt beside it and covered his face with his hands. His hands were cold and damp and his limbs ached with chill. Bodily unrest and chill and weariness beset him routing his thoughts. Why was he kneeling there like a child, saying his evening prayers? To be alone with his soul, to examine his conscience, to meet his sins face to face, to recall their times and manners and circumstances, to weep over them. He could not weep. He could not summon them to his memory. He felt only an ache of soul and body, his whole being, memory, will, understanding, flesh, benumbed and weary. That was the work of devils, to scatter his thoughts and overcloud his conscience, assailing him at the gates of the cowardly and sin-corrupted flesh. And praying God timidly to forgive him his weakness, he crawled up on the bed and, wrapping the blankets closely about him, covered his face again with his hands. He had sinned. He had sinned so deeply against heaven and before God that he was not worthy to be called God's child. Could it be that he, Stephen Dedalus, had done those things? His conscience sighed an answer. Yes, he had done them, secretly, filthily, time after time. And hardened in sinful impenitence, he had dared to wear the mask of holiness before the tabernacle itself, while his soul within was a living mass of corruption. How came it that God had not struck him dead? The leprous company of his sins closed about him, breathing upon him, bending over him from all sides. He strove to forget them in an act of prayer, huddling his limbs closer together and binding down his eyelids. But the senses of his soul would not be bound, and though his eyes were shut fast, he saw the places where he had sinned. Though his ears were tightly covered, he heard. He desired with all his will not to hear or see. He desired till his frame shook under the strain of his desire and until the senses of his soul closed. They closed for an instant and then opened. He saw. A field of stiff weeds and thistles and tufted nettle bunches. Thick among the tufts of rank stiff growth lay battered canisters and clots and coils of solid excrement. A faint marsh light struggling upwards from all the ordure through the bristling grey-green weeds. 
An evil smell, faint and foul as the light, curled upwards sluggishly out of the canisters and from the stale, crusted dung. Creatures were in the field. One, three, six. Creatures moving in the field, hither and hither. Goatish creatures with human faces, horny-browed, lightly bearded and grey as India rubber. The malice of evil glittered in their hard eyes as they moved hither and thither, trailing their long tails behind them. A rictus of cruel malignity lit up greyly their old bony faces. One was clasping about his ribs a torn flannel waistcoat, another complained monotonously as his beard stuck in the tufted weeds. Soft language issued from their spittleless lips as they swished in slow circles round and round the field, winding hither and thither through the weeds, dragging their long tails amid the rattling canisters. They moved in slow circles, circling closer and closer, to enclose, to enclose, soft language issuing from their lips, their long swishing tails besmeared with stale shite, thrusting upwards their terrific faces. Help! He flung the blankets from him madly to free his face and neck. That was hell. God had allowed him to see the hell reserved for his sins, stinking, bestial, malignant, a hell of lecherous goatish fiends. For him! For him! He sprang from the bed, the reeking odour pouring down his throat, clogging and revolting his entrails. Air! The air of heaven! He stumbled towards the window, groaning and almost fainting with sickness. At the washstand a convulsion seized him from within, and clasping his cold forehead wildly he vomited profusely in agony. When the fit had spent itself he walked weakly to the window, and lifting the sash sat in a corner of the embrasure and leaned his elbow upon the sill. The rain had drawn off, and amid the moving vapours from point to point of light the city was spinning about herself a soft cocoon of yellowish haze. Heaven was still and faintly luminous, and the air sweet to breathe, as in a thicket drenched with showers. And amid peace and shimmering lights and quiet fragrance he made a covenant with his heart. He prayed. He once had meant to come on earth in heavenly glory, but we sinned. And then he could not safely visit us but with a shrouded majesty and a bedimmed radiance, for he was God. So he came himself in weakness, not in power, and he sent thee, a creature in his stead, with a creature's comeliness and lustre suited to our state. And now thy very face and form, dear mother, speak to us of the eternal, not like earthly beauty, dangerous to look upon, but like the morning star which is thy emblem, bright and musical breathing purity, telling of heaven and infusing peace. O harbinger of day, O light of the pilgrim, lead us still as thou hast led. In the dark night across the bleak wilderness, guide us on to our Lord Jesus. Guide us home. His eyes were dimmed with tears, and looking humbly up to heaven, he wept for the innocence he had lost. When evening had fallen, he left the house, and the first touch of the damp, dark air and the noise of the door as it closed behind him made ache again his conscience, lulled by prayer and tears. Confess, confess! It was not enough to lull the conscience with a tear and a prayer. He had to kneel before the minister of the Holy Ghost and tell over his hidden sins truly and repentantly. Before he heard again the footboard of the house door trail over the threshold as it opened to let him in, before he saw again the table in the kitchen set for supper, he would have knelt and confessed. It was quite simple. The ache of conscience ceased, and he walked onward swiftly through the dark streets. There were so many flagstones on the footpath of that street, and so many streets in that city, and so many cities in the world. Yet eternity had no end. He was in mortal sin. Even once was a mortal sin. It could happen in an instant. But how so quickly? By seeing or by thinking of seeing. The eyes see the thing without having wished first to see it. Then, in an instant, it happens. But does that part of the body understand or what? The serpent, the most subtle beast of the field. It must understand when it desires in one instant and then prolongs its own desire instant after instant sinfully. It feels and understands and desires. What a horrible thing! 
Who made it to be like that? A bestial part of the body, able to understand bestially and desire bestially. Was that then he, or an inhuman thing moved by a lower soul? His soul sickened at the thought of a torpid snaky life, feeding itself out of the tender marrow of his life, and fattening upon the slime of lust. Oh, why was that so? Oh, why? He cowered in the corner of the thought, abasing himself in the awe of God, who made all things and all men. Madness! Who could think such a thought? And cowering in darkness and abject, he prayed mutely to his guardian angel to drive away with his sword the demon that was whispering to his brain. The whisper ceased, and he knew then clearly that his own soul had sinned in thought and word and deed willfully through his own body. Confess! He had to confess every sin. How could he utter in words to the priest what he had done? Must! Must! Or how could he explain without dying of shame? Or how could he have done such things without shame? A madman! Confess! Oh, he would indeed, to be free and sinless again. Perhaps the priest would know. Oh, dear God! He walked on and on through ill-lit streets, fearing to stand still for a moment lest it might seem that he held back from what awaited him, fearing to arrive at that towards which he still turned with longing. How beautiful must be a soul in the state of grace when God looked upon it with love! Frowsy girls sat along the curbstones before their baskets. Their dank hair hung trailed over their brows. They were not beautiful to see as they crouched in the mire. But their souls were seen by God, and if their souls were in a state of grace, they were radiant to see, and God loved them seeing them. A wasting breath of humiliation blew bleakly over his soul to think of how he had fallen, to feel that those souls were dearer to God than his. The wind blew over him and passed on to the myriads and myriads of other souls on whom God's favour shone now more and now less stars now brighter and now dimmer, sustained and failing. And the glimmering souls passed away, sustained and failing, merged in a moving breath. One soul was lost, a tiny soul, his. It flickered once and went out, forgotten, lost. The end. Black, cold, void waste. Consciousness of place came ebbing back to him slowly over a vast tract of time, unlit, unfelt, unlived. The squalid scene composed itself around him, the common accents, the burning gas jets in the shops, odours of fish and spirits and wet sawdust, moving men and women. An old woman was about to cross the street, an oil can in her hand. He bent down and asked her was there a chapel near. A chapel, sir? Yes, sir. Church Street Chapel. Church? She shifted the can to her other hand and directed him. And as she held out her reeking, withered right hand under its fringe of shawl, he bent lower towards her, saddened and soothed by her voice. Thank you. You're quite welcome, sir. The candles on the high altar had been extinguished, but the fragrance of incense still floated down the dim nave. Bearded workmen with pious faces were guiding a canopy out through a side door, the sacristan aiding them with quiet gestures and words. A few of the faithful still lingered praying before one of the side altars or kneeling in the benches near the confessionals. He approached timidly and knelt at the last bench in the body, thankful for the peace and silence and fragrant shadow of the church. The board on which he knelt was narrow and worn and those who knelt near him were humble followers of Jesus. Jesus, too, had been born in poverty and had worked in the shop of a carpenter, cutting boards and planing them, and had first spoken of the kingdom of God to poor fishermen, teaching all men to be meek and humble of heart. He bowed his head upon his hands, bidding his heart be meek and humble, that he might be like those who knelt beside him, and his prayers as acceptable as theirs. He prayed beside them, but it was hard. His soul was foul with sin, and he dared not ask forgiveness with the simple trust of those whom Jesus, in the mysterious ways of God, had called first to his side, the carpenters, the fishermen, poor and simple people following a lowly trade, handling and shaping the wood of trees, 
mending their nets with patience. A tall figure came down the aisle and the penitents stirred, and at the last moment, glancing up swiftly, he saw a long grey beard and the brown habit of a capuchin. The priest entered the box and was hidden. Two penitents rose and entered the confessional at either side. The wooden slide was drawn back, and the faint murmur of a voice troubled the silence. His blood began to murmur in his veins, murmuring like a sinful city summoned from its sleep to hear its doom. Little flakes of fire fell, and powdery ashes fell softly, alighting on the houses of men. They stirred, waking from sleep, troubled by the heated air. The slide was shot back. The penitent emerged from the side of the box. The farther side was drawn. A woman entered quietly and deftly where the first penitent had knelt. The faint murmur began again. He could still leave the chapel. He could stand up, put one foot before the other, and walk out softly, and then run, run, run swiftly through the dark streets. He could still escape from the shame. Had it been any terrible crime but that one sin? Had it been murder? Little fiery flakes fell and touched him at all points. Shameful thoughts, shameful words, shameful acts. Shame covered him wholly like fine glowing ashes falling continually. To say it in words, his soul, stifling and helpless, would cease to be. The slide was shot back. A penitent emerged from the farther side of the box. The near slide was drawn. A penitent entered where the other penitent had come out. A soft, whispering noise floated in vaporous cloudlets out of the box. It was the woman. Soft, whispering cloudlets. Soft, whispering vapour, whispering and vanishing. He beat his breast with his fist humbly, secretly under the cover of the wooden armrest. He would be at one with others and with God. He would love his neighbour. He would love God who had made and loved him. He would kneel and pray with others and be happy. God would look down on him and on them and would love them all. It was easy to be good. God's yoke was sweet and light. It was better never to have sinned, to have remained always a child, for God loved little children and suffered them to come to him. It was a terrible and a sad thing to sin, but God was merciful to poor sinners who were truly sorry. How true that was! That was indeed goodness! The slide was shot too suddenly. The penitent came out. He was next. He stood up in terror and walked blindly into the box. At last it had come. He knelt in the silent gloom and raised his eyes to the white crucifix suspended above him. God could see that he was sorry. He would tell all his sins. His confession would be long, long. Everybody in the chapel would know then what a sinner he had been. Let them know. It was true. But God had promised to forgive him if he was sorry. He was sorry. He clasped his hands and raised them towards the white form, praying with his darkened eyes, praying with all his trembling body, swaying his head to and fro like a lost creature, praying with whimpering lips. Sorry, sorry, oh, sorry. The slide clicked back and his heart bounded in his breast. The face of an old priest was at the grating, averted from him, leaning upon a hand. He made the sign of the cross and prayed of the priest to bless him for he had sinned. Then, bowing his head, he repeated the confitior in fright. At the words, my most grievous fault, he ceased breathless. How long is it since your last confession, my child? A long time, father. A month, my child. Longer, father. Three months, my child. Longer, father. Six months. Eight months, father. He had begun. The priest asked, And what do you remember since that time? He began to confess his sins, masses missed, prayers not said, lies. Anything else, my child? Sins of anger, envy of others, gluttony, vanity, disobedience. Anything else, my child? There was no help. He murmured, I committed sins of impurity, father. The priest did not turn his head. With yourself, my child? And with others. With women, my child? Yes, father. Were they married women, my child? He did not know. His sins trickled from his lips one by one, 
trickled in shameful drops from his soul, festering and oozing like a sore, a squalid stream of vice. The last sins oozed forth, sluggish, filthy. There was no more to tell. He bowed his head, overcome. The priest was silent. Then he asked, How old are you, my child? Sixteen, father. The priest passed his hand several times over his face. Then, resting his forehead against his hand, he leaned towards the grating, and with eyes still averted, spoke slowly. His voice was weary and old. You are very young, my child, he said, and let me implore of you to give up that sin. It is a terrible sin. It kills the body and it kills the soul. It is the cause of many crimes and misfortunes. Give it up, my child, for God's sake. It is dishonourable and unmanly. You cannot know where that wretched habit will lead you, or where it will come against you. As long as you commit that sin, my poor child, you will never be worth one farthing to God. Pray to our mother Mary to help you. She will help you, my child. Pray to our blessed lady when that sin comes into your mind. I am sure you will do that, will you not? You repent of all those sins, I am sure you do. And you will promise God now that, by his holy grace, you will never offend him any more by that wicked sin. You will make that solemn promise to God, will you not? Yes, father. The old and weary voice fell like sweet rain upon his quaking, parching heart. How sweet and sad! Do so, my poor child. The devil has led you astray. Drive him back to hell when he tempts you to dishonour your body in that way. The foul spirit who hates our Lord. Promise God now that you will give up that sin, that wretched, wretched sin. Blinded by tears and by the light of God's mercifulness, he bent his head and heard the grave words of absolution spoken and saw the priest's hand raised above him in token of forgiveness. God bless you, my child. Pray for me. He knelt to say his penance, praying in a corner of the dark nave, and his prayers ascended to heaven from his purified heart like perfume streaming upwards from a heart of white rose. The muddy streets were gay. He strode homeward, conscious of an invisible grace pervading and making light his limbs. In spite of all, he had done it. He had confessed, and God had pardoned him. His soul was made fair and holy once more, holy and happy. It would be beautiful to die if God so willed. It was beautiful to live in grace, a life of peace and virtue and forbearance with others. He sat by the fire in the kitchen, not daring to speak for happiness. Till that moment he had not known how beautiful and peaceful life could be. The green square of paper pinned round the lamp cast down a tender shade. On the dresser was a plate of sausages and white pudding, and on the shelf there were eggs. They would be for the breakfast in the morning after the communion in the college chapel. White pudding and eggs and sausages and cups of tea. How simple and beautiful was life after all! And life lay all before him. In a dream he fell asleep. In a dream he rose and saw that it was morning. In a waking dream he went through the quiet morning towards the college. The boys were all there, kneeling in their places. He knelt among them, happy and shy. The altar was heaped with fragrant masses of white flowers, and in the morning light the pale flames of the candles among the white flowers were clear and silent as his own soul. He knelt before the altar with his classmates, holding the altar cloth with him over a living rail of hands. His hands were trembling and his soul trembled as he heard the priest pass with the ciborium from communicant to communicant. Corpus Domini Nostri. Could it be? He knelt there, sinless and timid, and he would hold upon his tongue the host, and God would enter his purified body. In vita maternum, amen. Another life, a life of grace and virtue and happiness. It was true. It was not a dream from which he would wake. The past was past. Corpus Domini Nostri. The Ciborium had come to him. End of chapter 3, part 2